Uh, I'm Perry Kavalowitz. I use your mic on. Can you hear me now? Fairly. Okay, my name is Eric Lubinsky. And uh, we're going to tell you a few stories about a very, from a different slant. And we, we wanted to talk a little bit about from the non Commodore developer perspective. Uh, so I was with uh, ASDG. Uh, I don't know if you, anybody remember the name. And <laughs> What's that? Release your source. Oh, uh, you know, uh, I desperately want to. Uh, I have a 3000 that hasn't been turned on in 25 years or something. I don't know how long it's been. But maybe it has the source code on it. Send uh, it to me. Yeah. <laughs> we could work that out. But I, I was introduced, I just introduced myself. Let's get to Eric. Okay, so my, my name is Eric Kubitsky, and I was uh, one of the First, uh, media developers on the East Coast. I uh, was lucky enough to attend the, uh, the launch of the Amiga at Lincoln Center. And I uh, got involved with Commodore. I had a history with Commodore because I had written some software for Commodore 64. And when I went to the launch, the Amiga launch, and afterwards there were uh, demonstrations at the, the Beaumont Theater, uh, I walked up to a guy logging into CompuServe on the brand of Alcotum, and he turned around and introduced himself and he said, Hi, my name is Jeff Porter, and you are Eric Lipinski? The Eric Lipinski? <laughs> and so it turns out that everybody at Commodore was using my communication software for the Commodore 64. It was an implementation of the current protocol for the Commodore 64. Remember way back when? Yeah, the, uh, the, uh, the Commodore 64 uh, permit was developed at Columbia University, Frank and Cruz, and so I did that implementation, along with another gentleman in uh, I ended up signing up for the rights to come over and they distributed it to Commodore 64. It turned out that Eric and I lived uh, probably half a mile from each other in uh, what, the Scandinavian Jersey? Yeah. Sorry, Eric. Sorry, sorry. Sorry, just, just pass them back and forth. Take this one. Which one? Okay. It was. French batteries do So, this is working. No. Okay, good. This is not working. Check, check, check. Test, 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 test. test. Well, not test. that high. What is that strange voice? Not that high. Yeah. Okay, so uh, it turned out that Eric and I linked within half a mile of each other. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the idea of, uh, of another person who has knows about this, this this new thing was just too attractive. Uh, we got together and we started the Jersey Amiga User Group, uh, which is not FOG, only because FOG met like, what, three days before? Yeah. So FOG uh, out here was uh, the first Amiga User Group, we were the second Amiga User Group. And man, did we have a lot of fun with that. We used to lug a, I had a 19 inch television, which weighed 50 pounds at least, and we would log that into a, a very large auditorium, and that was the entire display. People way back there would, would come in with binoculars practically to, to see the screen. Uh, one of the big parts of each meeting was the distribution of the fish disks. Uh, now, at that time, it was called the Fred Fish Freely Redistributable Software Collection, and that was too much of a mouthful. So I kept talking about uh, fish disks, and uh, one day uh, it just came out fish disks, and and it was after, that's not the term that stuck, but fish disks did. So, so yeah, Perry and I had met because in, um, I actually have a copy of the original posting on August fifth, nineteen eighty five. I posted a posting in, uh, to the uh, ARPANET asking everybody if they were interested in starting an Amiga discussion group. So that launched Info Amiga, which was the first public electronic discussion group about the Amiga. And it eventually formed into net.micro.amiga um, net or comp.sys.amiga, one of those. And uh, Perry yeah, must have seen the posting and responded off of a Usenet feed. And we got together over at Rutgers University and we started meeting. And we were, you know, we were news spread like wildfire, I guess, even back then, you know, when we. <laughs> 
connectivity was very, very limited. And one of the, the first big public meetings that we had uh, was in December of that year when, when you know, we had been meeting with a small group at the Rutgers uh, Microcomputer Lab to start with. But when we first started meeting in the big auditorium at Hill Center at Rutgers, uh, it was in December in the middle of a snowstorm, a blizzard, and over 300 people came to the meeting. So there was clearly a, a little bit of interest in, in what we had to, to show. And Jeff Porter and Dave Verizowski from Commodore Westchester actually drove up through the blizzard and they brought with them a working Amiga 1300 Genlock, which we actually demoed at that meeting. So that was one of the first, outside of the, uh, the launch of the Amiga, one of the first public demonstrations of the Amiga 1300 Genlock. Yeah. Uh, Dale, I would love for you to explain, maybe now, maybe after, why you came to a job meeting in hip waders. <laughs> Dale uh, attended one of our job meetings and he was there, if you don't know what hip waders are, it's for a fisherman going deep into the water and it's boots that come up to here. And I don't know, but he will have to explain it. Actually, Dale, Dale came and he had a big fishing net with him too. So, he had just come from Westchester. This was, you know, he had to come from there first. He came from Westchester and he came over to see us and speak at our meeting and he said, as he walked into the meeting, he said, I'm wearing these because I just came from Commodore. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, shifting a little bit, uh, talk about ASDG for, for a few moments. Um, ASDG was started with some very, very uh, momentous words. And those were, after looking at Macintosh applications, saying, I could do at least as well as that asshole. <laughs> so, that was the genesis of uh, ASDG. I was going to go into business, I was going to go into business on the Macintosh. And uh, with this crappy little black and white and the beep beep noises. And then I heard about this machine. This machine with this wonderful color, wonderful audio, and preemptive multitasking and being an operating systems geek was like sold. So that's I'm going on the Amiga. With all these things, what could possibly go wrong? It's surely the hit. And ASDG was actually founded with the idea of doing data acquisition and laboratory instrumentation. So if we could just store that away for a moment. We couldn't go into business doing that. That's what I wanted to do. So we did bread and butter product, like memory boards. Uh, and I heard that uh, another manufacturer of memory boards was going to do a recoverable RAM disk. And it was a rumor, and I, ha I knew I had to have one. So that was a, a 48 hour straight stretch uh, sitting at the Amiga, uh, working on it, working from the track disk uh, driver manual, BCPL, I think, and just trying to, to reverse that into a real language. And, uh, uh, and that's what came, came out. Now it turned out, nobody ever, there was no other, it was just a rumor, nobody ever did it. And uh, so that was fortunate for us. Uh, and then uh, uh, trying to come up with uh, so we finally had some income. By the way, that recoverable RAM disk was sh released as shareware, and it was $10. And for the first three years of ASDG, I didn't collect a dime. Uh, I had no salary. My first salary was $6 an hour, and I was happier than prouder than anything. So those $10 donations, anybody here send in one of those $10 donations? Yeah? That, you guys fed me. That's what I lived on. I lived on those $10 donations, so thank you. Thank you. So that, uh, I don't want to take up too much time. So the, how did we get from hardware into color graphics? And it turns out that after a while we had some income and we finally got a chance to do a board that would do laboratory instrument data acquisition. It's called the TwinX board and it implemented some Intel or uh, I don't remember, uh, Intel uh, standard for plug-in modules. And one of the plug-in modules was GPIB, General Purpose Instrument Bus, and that was for the laboratory instrument. And I was so proud of it, and I went to Comdex Atlanta to show it to Commodore and say, hey, here's this cool market, I can get you into it. That was my intention, of course, it didn't happen. Uh, and I was there for the second day, because nobody can talk to you on the first day of the show. So I was there on the second day, and uh, it was raining, 
and I get out to the street and I, I'm waiting for the show bus. The show bus is not coming, it's raining. There's a cab over there. Should I take a cab? No, I can't afford a cab. Uh, uh, should I wait for the show? No, it's still raining. I'm going to take a Okay, finally I decide I'm going to take a cab. So I get in the cab and I'm closing the door and a hand in a really nice suit, a hand with a nice suit uh, uh, comes in, locks the door, and a head comes in and says, hey, are you going to the show? Can I share the cab with you? And I say, sure. And I'm thinking to myself, here I am, I'm 24, 25, and I'm president of my own company, and these people are all swarming around like little ants in suits, and they'll never know the, you know, the joy of being their own. And uh, I was feeling magnanimous, so I decided I would start a conversation. And I said to the guy, uh, so, how has the show been for you? And he goes, oh man, it was really rough yesterday. I had 18 press interviews. And I said, who are you? And uh, it was the manager of a brand new division of Sharp Electronics who was introducing the first scanner, color scanner, you could put on a desktop. And uh, I said, oh wow, that's really cool. How does it talk? to the computer. And he said, well, it's, it's, it's odd, it's GPIB. <laughs> and I said, oh, I have a GPIB board right here. It's for the Amiga, uh, Commodore Amiga. Have you considered that? And he goes, wow, Commodore. Jack Tremiel fired me through a bathroom door once. <laughs> <laughs> sure, come on by the booth and let's talk. And it turned out that they only had two of them in the country. They let us, lent us one for a month. And they said, well, okay, after a month, we'll send some people there. And uh, if we, you know, you know, we'll see what you do with it. So a month later, they come by, and we wrote the GKIB driver, and then the, the first uh, version of ScanLab, which was uh, TAD before, uh, before that, before we discovered that ScanLab was a trademark. Uh, and they came and looked at it and said, you know what, you guys keep the scan. And that's how we got into the color imaging business. So, you know, as Perry mentioned, we met and uh, we started uh, working together in late night hacking sessions. So I had come from Rutgers University. Um, and actually when the Amiga was launched, I was still a student, but I was also working already. I was working at a, a venture of the New York Times called New York Video Text. Anybody remember what Video Text was? Right? Na Naplips? You know what Naplips was? Randall. Very good. So we actually had, it was like AOL 20 years too early. You know, it, we had all the New York Times movie reviews and databases, restaurant guides, real-time news. We ended up doing a deal with the Chemical Bank and we had home banking, all on a navigable home graphics terminal. And this was in 1985. Um, so, you know, when I heard about the Amiga in, in 1984, we heard the rumors from, uh, I guess it was Comdex. I had been hacking Macintoshes at, at Rutgers and laser printer drivers and that sort of thing. And I thought, you know, color and multitasking, this is way better than a Mac. This is what I'm really interested in. And, you know, when uh, I, I was able to finally uh, thank, um, at the time, Karen, it was Karen Day Davis was the manager of Amiga Developer Relations. She's now Karen Michael. You might have heard that name. And she was a wonderful person who just, you know, was just helpful, you know, in, in a way that, especially as a young kid, I was only 20 years old, you know, you, you just, I couldn't thank her enough. And um, I ended up, after the Amiga launch, well, I actually had a machine uh, that, you know, I was waiting for a developer machine, and I actually had a machine that was supposed to go to SAS Lattice, was diverted to me instead. And I went to Commodore directly to pick it up. And, you know, I felt it wasn't enough for me to know about this machine. Other people had to know about this machine. So aside from the ARPANET and Usenet, which were the only really two big, you know, sort of international means of connecting and, and talking. There were a couple of up and coming uh, home information services. And one of them was actually one that was based out of Sausalito, I believe, which was called The Well, which stood, stood for the Whole Earth Electronic Link. Mm -hmm. And so we became active on The Well, Harry and I on the, on the East Coast. And then there was also BICS, which was the Byte Information Exchange, some of you may remember. And, you know, since we were talking and discussing, we got to know other people who had interests in the Amiga and, and were working with the Amiga. And we sort of became known as the East Coast gurus, so to speak, of Amiga knowledge. There weren't really other people on the East Coast who were as active as we were. 
so one day, um, you know, I'm I'm hanging out at, at my apartment, and there's a knock on the door, and I look downstairs, and it's Perry he comes to my apartment because I had moved a little bit further away at this point, and <laughs> trundling up the stairs, there's a VW minibus pulls out up front, and trundling up the stairs is none other than John Draper, Captain Crunch. Crunch. And he has a Mac Plus strapped onto his back with his dreadlock, he had dreadlocks at the time, dreadlock hair. And the first words out of his mouth when he came into my, my apartment were, where's the phone? <laughs> <laughs> so um, John had connected up with Perry through the well and, and, and he learned about us. And so he came out, when he came out, he wanted to visit with us to learn more about, you know, the Amiga and what we did and what happened. Forgive me, uh, for, uh, I hope John forgives me, uh, but I'll, I'll do a, a John impersonation that was, uh, knock, knock, knock. Hey, I'm John Draper. I, I like the Amiga. You like the Amiga. Can I stay here? So, okay. And uh, uh, we, uh, uh, he, he was a very interesting guy, and he stayed over, and he had a very, very special pillow. Uh, he had a bad back, very, very special pillow. When he had left, uh, he called up frantically saying, uh, I, have, I have my pillow, you know, I got it's my special pillow, I gotta have my pillow, I can't steal it like that. And uh, I actually drove his pillow from New Jersey into Greenwich Village uh, because he needed it. Uh, and, and oh, by the way, that VW microbus, when I took a look at this guy standing in my door, I imagine, when, and later he said that some friends were going to come to him. And he said, uh, I imagined that it was going to be a VW microbus with tassels in the windows and hot smoke billowing out, out the windows. And up rolls a VW microbus with tassels in the windows and hot smoke and bill billowing out the, uh, out, out, out the windows. So yeah. So those late night hacking sessions. And I remember a night, it was very early, actually in wee hours in the morning, uh, Eric and I working together, and I turned to Eric and I said, I bet we're the first people outside Commodore on, on the East Coast to have a string gadget working. <laughs> string gadget was, was, was hard, but it was that kind of thing, is that, that, that spirit of, of novelty, spirit of adventure, spirit of, of exploration. And you know, we, we all had it, we all had it. What a remarkable, well, you've heard this from many speakers, what a remarkable time. Yeah, so that sort of activity, you know, uh, ended up really flourishing when the shows started happening. And Amy Expo, I believe the first one was in 1987. And uh, we were both asked to speak uh, at Amy Expo. Perry gave a, a, I think like a programming seminar on C. And I moderated a panel discussion. And on my panel was John Tobis from Lattice, and Jim Goodnow from Manx, and Charlie Heath from Microsmith. And we had a uh, programming in the Amiga panel discussion. And um, after that session, you know, I, I met, met a bunch of people. The show organizers thought, hey, that was really good. We'd like to do more training seminars about the Amiga, so can you develop something? So I said, sure, you know, that's, was, you know, I was really into it. I posted the first public Amiga code onto the ARPANET, and it actually made it onto fish disk number one because it was the first ever public code. It was just, you know, hello world opening up a window. But it was the first, so you know that was my passion. I really wanted to share what I knew about the Amiga with other people. So I started to develop this training course, and it became the Introduction to Programming the Amiga course, which uh, eventually Commodore said, hey, that's pretty neat, Eric. You want to teach that at our developers' conference. So that led to me teaching the Intro to Amiga Programming course at the developers' conferences, and Commodore actually contracted me to teach that seminar to certain companies that they were interested in porting to be developers. One of those was Lotus. So somewhere around 1988 or whenever it was, I don't remember the exact time, I went up to Cambridge State of the Royal Senesta and I did like two or three days of seminars for Lotus because the Commodore was interested in having them, I think you said Peter was Jazz, Lotus Jazz that they wanted to have ported to DBA. It never happened, but hey, you know, that was the start of a great you know, uh, relationship for me with Commodore. I had this sort of, you know, unique developer relationship because it only took an hour and a half from where we lived at the time for me to get to Westchester. And um, 
you know, I got involved at that level, so started to go and I sort of was enigmatic. You know, people didn't know who I worked for or what I did. And I think to this day, I still get these questions. I still get these questions. Eric, did you work for Amiga or for Commodore? Did you work for ASTG? You know, I mean, they could never quite get it. So, yeah, the answer is I didn't have, had never worked for any of them. <laughs> I was my own person, and um, you know, I was just really interested in sharing the Amiga and and being part of this bigger community. And and that passion, you know, was something they carried through with me to this day. The uh, developer community was extraordinary. Uh, you remind me of Jim Good now. Uh, he had an assembler, right? Yeah. And Max, 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 and uh, we all knew each other. We were, we were able to reach each other on the phone, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, I ran into a bug. In it turned out I spent days looking for a bug. Uh, it turned out to be a compiler bug. Uh, and uh, I rang up uh, Jim Good now, and I just screamed at him. I'm so sorry, Jim. I just screamed and screamed and screamed, and and I said, "Oh, um, did you get the latest one? Uh, that was fixed about a month ago." And I said, "Oh, that's days of my life. I'll never get back." And now uh, uh, another thing is, you remember the Amiga had no isolation between tasks, so if one application failed, the entire system would come down. So this actually had a social uh, effect on how developers developed. I mean, we all ran other people's code. I mean, if I'm developing, uh, doing something, and I might be working on a document also, uh, so if the, if the, if, pay, pay, uh, gold disk, gold, what was their program? Page Maker. Page Maker. If Page Maker crashed, I, would, I was screwed. So, if a, we all ran things like uh, Enforcer, and if there was a problem which uh, uh, manifested itself, we'd get in touch with the other developers, because we had an investment in their code working. Because any, an error anywhere would bring us all down. And uh, I'll tell you, uh, and the, the Amiga OS, over time, uh, with the applications, we had, Amigas were able to run without reboot for six, seven, eight months, uh, just cranking out, cranking out work, 24 hours a day. It was a, I, I teach an operating systems course, uh, a college college course, and I continually come back to the to Amiga OS as an example of when things get done right. So. So I don't want to. Hear, I don't want to hear how you did it wrong. I just want to. I just want to keep thinking about how you did it right. And you guys did. It was ever in the audience. You guys did it so right. So so right. So one thing that was always impressive about the the core team at Commodore and you know and previously obviously at Amiga was that the 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 development the engineering staff at Commodore was very passionate about what they did and they wanted everything to be the best and to be correct and. Um, I was very fortunate for my relationship with them that I got to um, you know, work very closely with many of them. And uh, I had been working, uh, after I left the New York Times, I worked at uh, Bell Labs in Murray Hill for a number of years. I ran all the systems for the advanced software department. Uh, people like David Korn and Steve Bellavin were in my group if you know any of those names. But um, I had a very good friend who was a member of our, our user group, and this was again sort of one of these circuitous connections. Uh, and he was a, uh, a physicist and mathematician, uh, and he was doing underwater acoustic research at Bell Labs in Whippany. And why do you need to do underwater acoustic research? You know, we need to find things like what, <laughs> like submarines, maybe. Yeah. So you know, so this was the sort of work that he was doing. He was a very interesting guy, and he was an astronomer also. And he had uh, figured out, you know, a the mathematical mathematical reason why stars appear to twinkle. And he wanted to do the simulations on his Amiga because he loved the Amiga, but he didn't have enough mathematical horsepower to do it at the, at the time. So he was working on a design for uh, putting a hardware DSP into the Amiga. And he needed some help. So I went to my friends at Commodore Engineering and I said, hey, this is a cool project. Could you help us? And they said, sure. You know, we'll help you do the layout and we'll help you get a, a board level, uh, you know, first boards out. Great. So we got that done. And things started to develop and become more interesting. And 
uh, I have connections at Bell Labs, we discovered that AT&T has had this great DSP technology back in uh, the early 90s, and they could do all of this real-time speech synthesis, and they could do even Mandarin Chinese, they could do uh, speech recognition, you know, uh, video decoding, uh, B.32 modem on a chip, and it was all multitasking and, and multitasking friendly. So I actually then ended up, you know, becoming uh, a contractor for Commodore because we were going to integrate this DSP into the next generation Amiga. And uh, at Commodore, Randall Jessup was the, the software, you know, lead who worked with me and Dave Haney. I don't know if Dave's in the room, but Dave was uh, the engineer and uh, the hardware guy. And we put the whole thing together and in, uh, in 93 at the Orlando DevCon we actually demoed it. Uh, anybody who here was at DevCon 93? A few hands. So we showed, you know, we showed real like CD quality, you know, MPEG, MPEG audio playback. We showed uh, video decoding, you know, uh, still image decoding that was way faster because the DSP could do about 33 megaflops uh, of single precision floating point back then. And it was way faster than even a 60 or 6840 could do at the time. So um, that product, you know, was a great, great concept, great, great product. But unfortunately, you know, with the way that uh, the engineering management, the, the, or the company management had gone to come over, it never saw the light of day. But a little known fact that people don't know is that that product actually did get released. And there was a small uh, company, actually a good-sized company, in the Seattle area that a number of Commodore people had gone to called ATL uh, Ultrasound, and they made ultrasound imaging equipment. And they designed this machine around an A4000 core with a 6860. They did their own beamformer in gallium arsenide, so when you're doing the, getting the echoes back from the ultrasound, you do a technique called beamforming to get all the information back, and then they were using, what do you know, the same at t DSPs to do the signal processing, and you know they could do Doppler and they could track blood flow, very very cool stuff. The whole thing, so I helped them do the software, you know, the software architecture for that, and consulted on the product, and it got released. It had to go through FDA approval, so all of our test vectors and stuff had to had to be FDA had to be documented for the FDA, and it actually shipped. It was the ATL HDI 1000, the first all digital ultrasound machine, was based around an Amiga, and not too many people know that fact. And I still have one in my garage. If you'd ever like to come by and look at one. I don't know how we're doing on time, but let me tell you uh, another couple of stories. Um, uh, ASDG tech support. Um, we had a call that went like this. Uh, can you tell me, uh, can you give me some help on product XXXXXX? And uh, we said, well, uh, we don't make that. And the user said, yeah, I, I know you don't make it, but those guys don't answer their phones. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the, the, another one is uh, Dick Van Dyke is a, it was a tremendous advocate of digital video, and, and still is. And uh, I, can't, I, can't just, I can't describe to you the time that he called up for tech support on that girl, and we got him to sing Chim Chimney. <laughs> Does he know he's here? I think maybe he should come get it. <laughs> yeah. So uh, maybe we should turn over to questions. Is that, uh, okay. So how many people here were at the Washington DevCon? Right? right? Washington Dev. I think it was '88 or '88. So um, this is just to show that you know the, the camaraderie and the developer community, and, and how even though we were this really diverse group of people. We all shared some common things, even beyond the Amiga. So back then, one of the popular television shows was, uh, especially for us geeks, was Star Trek: The Next Generation. And you know, think we had we had something called the VCR. But you know, if you didn't watch a show generally when it was broadcast, you missed it. So uh, it turns out that there was some function going on during DevCon, and we couldn't watch Star Trek: The Next Generation live. So uh, a friend of mine, a developer, Randy Spencer, who unfortunately isn't here, I haven't been in touch with him, but it turns out that he had family in Arlington, you know, Virginia, not far away. So during the day, we trucked out in a car and we went to his, uh, his folks' house there and we picked up a VCR and we brought it back to DEF 
and it was, I think, at the Hotel Lafayette in Washington. And we went ahead and uh, set it up for a board. So then at midnight, you know, like 50 or 60 or whatever of, of us developers, we all board into this room and they had one of these early projection TVs. And started showing the program and it was, you know, Denise Crosby was still on the show. Her wow. character was Lieutenant Tasha Yar, for any of you who remember the show. And, okay, so during the show, we discover, you know, things progress and there's this, like, oil slick creature on the show. And it's the episode where Tasha Yar gets killed. Oh my goodness, right? So, the moment that she gets killed, everybody simultaneously in the room jumps up cheering. <laughs> Because, yeah, I guess we all thought the same, right? I mean, so, and it was like an unwritten kind of thing, but we all, we all were on the same wavelength this way. So the developer community was a wonderful community that way. You know, we could go out at developers' conferences, and we could talk on these electronic services, and there was a lot of camaraderie. And these past two days, I really need to thank, you know, Perry for asking me to be up here with him, and, and to Bill, and all the volunteers, and, and, uh, and Dale, Helped, I know, in a big way, organize this event. But the past two days have been this incredibly compressed, uh, you know, experience of catching up with a lot of people who you haven't seen in a long time, and picking up like almost exactly where you left off. So it's been an incredible experience for us. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so I mean, I, I developed a software architecture that integrated the Amiga, uh, so the, the DSP from AT&T, they, they had an operating system that actually ran on the DSP. It was called VCOS, which served, stood for Visible Caching Operating System. And the fascinating thing about this was it was actually a time-sliced operating system that ran on the DSP. So you could do all of these functions, the, a modem, if you had enough header, a modem, JPEG decoding, all these things, uh, you know, all together on the single DSP. And then you could scale it. So if one DSP wasn't enough, you could just add additional DSPs. So, uh, you know, I, along with my, my, this friend that I told you about, and I'll mention his name because I didn't before, his name is uh, John Cadona, or UNNN Cadona, and I think he's a researcher now uh, at University of Arizona. But uh, uh, we had developed a dual DSP board, so we actually proved the concept with multiple DSPs. But the, the, the Amiga 3000 Plus only had a single DSP on it. But one thing that I actually, I actually didn't know that I discovered at this show was that I guess 
you know, Dave and, and Randall had been working on, they did a prototype board that had 16 DSPs on it. And my software would have worked on that no problem. So, you know, we designed it that way. So, and in fact, uh, another little interesting anecdote. Uh, here's an interesting anecdote I'll get into. So the, um, the uh, ultrasound machine had, I believe, uh, two DSPs in it. But right just after when Tumblr was going under, a small little company came to me because they had a guy going to Murray Hill Bell Labs and working on this project that they needed help. There was a small little company called B. You ever hear of B? Right. So this guy, Bob Merrill, was working uh, in Murray Hill and he was you know, commuting in from Santa Cruz or wherever they were at the time and it was too much. So they contracted me to help them with their product. So I flew out here and they moved to San Jose and I did some work. Uh, you know, I, I set up shop and did some work out here before moving back and there the system actually had two Hobbit processors from AT&T, which was based on the CRISP. And they had, I think, three DSP3210s inside their original hardware. But the most interesting thing about that whole story was I, uh, Jean-Louis Gasset and Steve Sackman. Steve Sackman was the guy who created the Color Mac and then ultimately was the hardware lead on the Apple Newton. They, they took me, they went, I went to his house, and uh, Jean-Louis Gasset and Steve Sackman took me out for lunch. And they, sh they shared with me, and they actually gave me a physical copy of their business plan for B. And the, one of the most validating things that I had ever heard from somebody outside of Commodore at the, you know, at the time to that day, and even to this day, was that the preamble to their business plan talked about the Amiga. And it said that when, when John Louis Gasse was at Apple and they, the Amiga was coming out, that they were actually quaking in their boots. They were nervous because they said, oh my god, it's color, it's got video, hardware animation, and sprites, and they thought that this was internally a killer technology that could really hurt Apple. And his vision for B was he wanted to create, because he thought that Commodore was, you know, such a messed up company, he wasn't far off from that in terms of management and certain how to sell into education. And the thing that impressed me was, uh, back then, uh, I was very active in Cigarette, I think I mentioned earlier, and uh, Commodore would bring us into to you know, promote the cutting edge things for the Amiga. And at Cigarette 89, Harry Copperman had just started. One of the first things that he did that impressed me was he asked all the developers that were there to come in and have a one on one event because he wanted to hear from us as a developer community. And if that had been, you know, I think the case, if that had been the case early on, or if that had been the case and somehow you know, really filtered up to people who really controlled the company, because Ultimately, a guy like Harry Copperman didn't control the company. It was, you know, people like Irving Gould and ultimately Benny Ali who really, you know, held the reins on the company. I think the, the story of the Amiga could have been different. You know, we, we could have had a much different act. Uh, something that was said yesterday, a gentleman who was standing by the curtain said, there's all these things coming together uh, for the first time. And uh, I'd like to pass on to you an image Imagine we are all standing around a, a large uh, vessel and there's the graphics person has their essence and they pour it in the tub. And the music person has their essence and they pour it in the tub. And the, all of the other mod modalities, they have their essences and they pour it in the tub. And all of these fluids come rushing together and do what it is that, you know, when the fluids come together, they mix and they bubble and they, and, and, and they do amazing things. And that, when that gentleman was talking about it, that, that was, that's, I think, is a real, reasonable, physical analogy of why the Amiga was so special. All of these things, it truly was, all of these things coming together and merging and melding and, and mixing in ways that nobody thought possible. So I hope I answered your question. Any other questions? Um, I'm just curious how big ASDG was at the Okay, uh, ASDG, the question was how big was ASDG? And I'll answer that and I'll give you one, one little short story about that. Uh, ASD grew to, ASDG grew to 35 people. Uh, and we never moved out of the garage. We, we simply uh, started uh, renting more and more garages. <laughs> Now, a senior executive from Avid came to visit, and he walked in and he goes, you're in a bleeping garage. I mean, I, this is really a garage. You're in a garage. And, well, 
and then Bob is saying, hang on. Do you have time for any more? How do you have time? Okay, any more questions? Thank you, everybody. I have some uh, artifacts up here. If any of you want to come see them, I have uh, some of the original postings that, that started the Amiga discussion groups, and I have some of the papers and what have you in the uh, programming class that I developed for the Amiga. So if any of you would like to come up, I'd love to share them with you, so thank you.